and the question of particularly giving money to the church. And I don't know what you think when you hear someone standing on a platform like this and that they're going to talk about money and specifically giving money to the church. You might not know what you think because you might not have heard anyone doing that or at least for a long time. Well, this morning there's an opportunity to find out because that's what I'm going to do. And I just want to mention that it might... It actually seems a bit strange to me to be doing this on a day we've invited people to, for a newcomer's lunch. These two things are totally unrelated. I just want to make that clear. Um, this is something we, we felt as leaders and trustees was important to speak about. And we planned this some months ago. And then this, this lunch came along as well. Um, so they are unrelated. And it's actually something that I think is important for each of us to hear, however long we've been involved in the church. I first of all want to say there's a very practical reason for doing this, because it's probably no surprise when you think about it to realize that it costs money to enable us to do the things that we do. Could you put the first slide up, please, Joe? Because when we take into account the number of people that we employ, the things we do to bless our community, the upkeep of buildings and general running costs, it all adds up to about £5,000 a week, which is a chunk of change. And most of this is provided by the generous giving who are part of our church family, your generous giving. And I want to recognize that this morning and to thank you for your faithful, committed, financial support to the work of the church here. We do get some money from grants. We do get some money from letting out our buildings. But there is no central body that funds us so the bulk of it comes from people choosing to give their money. And it's a wonderful thing to know and to celebrate. I know it's less visible than it used to be as we haven't restarted taking offerings during the service post-lockdown. People are still giving very generously in a number of ways, normally through standing orders. And if you want to know how to give or to change what you give, please speak to either Peter Buchan or Ruth Grimshaw. If you don't know who they are, please talk to me and I'll point you in their direction. But how do we know how much? Particularly it, whether we're con currently contributing to the work of the church or not. And this is one of the reasons we don't often talk about it. Because one of the criticisms that people have of the church in general is that it only wants their money. And so it's important to be clear that anyone is welcome to be part of our church family, whether they are contributing financially or not. But is that the right thing to be doing once you've moved beyond being a visitor and made the decision to be part of the church family? And this takes me back to a phrase that Heather referred to when she was standing here some months ago. She might have. She might think, what on earth am I going to be saying now? Um, we just finished hosting a conference of church leaders here. And one of the things that has stuck with her, as she shared, shared that morning, and it still stuck with her, was that as God's people, it is not that we have got to do something, but that we get to do something as a privilege, not as an obligation. And that's the way I want to think about that question this morning. By briefly outlining some of the ways in which this this idea developed throughout the Bible and end by thinking of some challenging words of Jesus. So, in Genesis chapter 4, we find these words. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. This is the first time I'm aware of something like this happening in the Bible. Two sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, brought some of the things that they had grown or bred and offered them to God. They were farmers. One grew crops, the other kept animals. And they chose to offer some of what they had produced to God. It seems to be a totally voluntary act. A way of giving God thanks for what he provided for them. A way of recognizing their dependence on God. And later the Bible will teach us that everything we have, even life itself, comes from God. And so it's totally reasonable 
maybe even expected that we should give some of that back to him as an expression of appreciation and thanksgiving. And what this does suggest is that words expressing our appreciation of God is not enough. They need to be accompanied by action. Hundreds of years later, the people of God are a developing nation with an organized religion with priests and Levites, and they serve in in a place called the Tent of Meeting, uh, the place where the the people um, come to meet with God and to offer their sacrifices. And what we see is uh, God saying, I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do. Each person in the nation was required to give a tithe, a tenth of all they produced, to support the religious life of the nation. In our context, this is how we enable the church to function. Some of the rules that we could find in in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy get quite involved, but the principle is clear. It costs something to enable the people to worship God in the way he was calling them to, and they're commanded to cover that cost. Interestingly, um, the Levites had to do the same. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Levites and say to them, when you receive from the inheritance from the Israelites the tithe I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. They, the workers in the temple, were not exempt from the requirement. They had to give a tenth of what they received as an offering to God. Maybe it's an early example of everyone being in this together of shared commitment. So there was this expectation that on a regular, consistent basis, each person who was part of God's family was giving financially as part of that relationship. And this is the principle that many of us have bought into, that as part of God's family, we are privileged to regularly contribute financially to the work that God is calling us to do. And in the Old Testament, much of that was, was done in, in goods, flocks or, or crops. In our context, it's normally in terms of money. So that's something of what happened in the Old Testament story. Let's pick up that story in, in the New Testament. We'll think about something about the life of Paul. If you know anything about the life of this man... This, this apostle, this early leader in the life of the church. You might think about his dramatic conversion experience when he was traveling to Damascus. You might think about his powerful preaching. You might think about the hundreds of miles he traveled around the Mediterranean to speak about Jesus and to establish churches. You might think about all that he wrote that makes up much of our New Testament, including this letter in, uh, to, to Corinth. But you might not know that he organized a collection from churches around the Mediterranean to send to the believers in Jerusalem who were going through a really difficult time. This seems to become quite important to him and he encourages a range of churches to get involved. And in doing so, he outlines some important and interesting principles. And he says, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Saving it up so that when I come to you, no collections will need to be made. So here he's talking about the importance of doing something on a regular basis, putting aside each week an amount of money to be used to bless God's people. Not, in this case, for the local church, but for the church in Jerusalem, hundreds of miles away. And it's good to recognize that we, as a church, try and do the same thing we try and give away at least 10% of our income each year to support those who are serving God elsewhere or struggling because of their faith. But this principle that Paul is speaking about here, this principle of weekly giving is important. It says that we're serious about doing something, not just something we do when the mood takes us. And the other thing that Paul highlights is that each of us needs to think about what is appropriate based on our income. He doesn't speak specifically about giving a tenth, although that's a principle many people find useful. He is encouraging each person in Corinth to think carefully about what is appropriate based on what they receive and to give that money for the work of God's 
kingdom. And he picks up this theme again when he writes another letter to the believers in Corinth, reminding them of this. And he says the amount that they give is a choice each of them is to make. Each of you, he says, should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there's no pressure in what Paul is saying. There is no pressure in any of this. It's for each person to think about what God has done in their lives and to think about what response they think is appropriate for them to make and to do so cheerfully, recognizing that that is pleasing to God. And why, why wouldn't we want to act in a way that brings delight to God. So with this very quick tour through some of what the Bible says about this topic, we've identified some key principles that giving our money is a way of saying thanks to God. There's an expectation that each member of God's family will contribute financially to the work of God's church. But then each of us has the responsibility of deciding how much we give and then giving it cheerfully in response to all God has given us. But I think, I think there's something deeper to think about. And this is something that speaks about our attitudes and what is important to us. And to help us explore this very briefly, we're going to, to look at some powerful and challenging words of, of Jesus. Jesus was often in the business of coming up with some powerful and challenging words. And he expected people's lives to be changed as they heard what he had to say and allowed those words to sink into their lives and, and for God's spirit to speak to them and to say, this is what I want of you. Uh, the chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's gospel are, are known as the Sermon on the Mount. And that contains some radical teaching from Jesus on what it means to follow him of what Jesus expects of our thoughts and words and actions if we claim to be one of his followers. And partway through, Jesus picks up on this and talks about heart and money and treasure. He says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here, Jesus, as so often in this powerful sermon of his, is presenting his followers with a choice. And this choice is about where they are building their investment portfolio. He recognizes that we can choose to focus on building up earthly possessions and wealth. The latest, the latest gadget, a healthy pension pot, the perfect house. And he warns against that basically saying that these things are not permanent. They can be attacked and destroyed. We saw real examples of that last weekend with the powerful storms that hit our country, with people sadly losing their lives, with property being destroyed, with thousands of homes being left without power, and so on. We're seeing it worked out so sadly and tragically in Ukraine at the moment. What Jesus does is encourages his followers to focus on building up reserves in God's bank, on doing things that are significant in God's kingdom, things that will have value forever and that nothing can take away and destroy. And the reason he gives is powerful and challenging. He goes on to say this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we think about this, we probably recognize it in our own experience. If we pour our money into something, and we will spend time thinking about it. We want it to be the best it can be. We want to protect our investment. Some years ago, Joe and I were renting out our house in Reading. Uh, our tenants managed to cause a, a leak in a water pipe in the attic. You know, they didn't, they didn't make a hole in the pipe, but because of some of their inaction, um, it, it, it froze and it cracked and, and it leaked. They were away at the time. And it resulted in quite a bit of flooding, which was a real pain. And affected us 
more than it affected our friends because it was our house, our investment. We didn't want it damaged. Because we'd invested in it, it was important to us. And that's the point Jesus is making here. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But I think it's also got something to say to us when we, when we turn it round. <coughs> that where our treasure is, what we spend our money on, says something about our heart, about what's important to us. I watch quite a few detective shows on TV, and one of the phrases that often comes up is that they're going to follow the money with the idea that the suspect, what the suspect has spent their money on will say a lot about what is important to them, about what their priorities are. And that's what really challenged me when thinking about these words of Jesus in the, in the context of what we're exploring this morning. How I spend my money says something about what is important to me. And does that match up with what I say is important to me? If not, something is out of balance, and I need to work on that. So that asked me the question, what does how I spend my money on say how, about how important Jesus and the church and the work of God's kingdom is to me? What does how you spend your money say about how important Jesus, the church, the work of God's kingdom is to you. I came up with three possible responses to that question. There might be more. Probably there are. You might conclude you've got it about right. That you've, you've done what Paul encouraged us to do. You've, you've come before God and said, this is, this is my income. This is what I believe you are saying to me. This is what I should be giving and I'm doing it. You might conclude you've got it about right. You might conclude that even though you are giving to the work of God's kingdom, the amount does not match with the place that Jesus should have in your life. You might recognize that you aren't contributing financially at all, and, and you want to change that to experience some of the privilege of giving your money to help God's kingdom move forward. It's a question for each of us to reflect on, to pray into, to examine before God to respond to. We're going to take a few moments of quiet to do that. And I'll, I'll leave a couple of questions on the screen as a way of thinking about this. This morning, as we've thought about that, a couple of questions to think about. What is God saying to me? What am I going to do about it?